I'm doing fine. Well, you guys? Yeah, well, uh, my fault. Yeah, yeah, do you, you, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's fine. I have a bit of a cold, but I am feeling better now, actually. Apologize to the listeners, because indeed, the show was delayed until today for various reasons. Um, but we are here, as with every week, talking about space and stuff. We will start shortly. I'm not sure if, Michael, do you want to, to, to make sure that the streaming is live and running? Ah, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Nice. Yeah, um. yeah, so the topic of the day is exploring Mars, everything about the red planet. It is a very, um, well, not very different, but unusual topic for our segment because usually we deal with way larger things and way older things than just a puny planet in our irrelevant solar system but we decided to just go back a little bit and and talk about mars because it's quite a um hot topic recently right there's, to there's a lot of yeah there's a lot of talk it is supposed to be the next the next frontier like the moon was back in the day now we we look at Mars, and um, compared to the galaxy and to the rest of the universe, it may just be it may just be a small step, but at the moment it is the challenge. And um, we have gathered a few questions, not many to be fair, not yet, but as usual, we take questions live both on the um, Discord, on the Distant Radio Discord server. On the Dangerous Cosmology channel, as well as in the Fleetcom server in the Astronomy channel. So, uh, if you have questions, feel free to ask. And of course, also on YouTube and Twitch, as Michael is streaming on there. So, as as you're listening to this, if you have any questions related to Mars or, to be fair, anything else related to space, because I believe that we will have some time to answer some random questions, feel free to ask. So, Shoba. Yes. Uh, I know that you're a cosmologist, you, you don't really specialize in, in, in our solar system, right? But I'm pretty sure that you know a lot than the average person about, about Mars and about the challenges and about the benefits that such an endeavor would allow us to reap. I'm a, I'm a pretty average space nerd in general. Well, I don't know. I don't know. You're, you're, you have a PhD in astrophysics. I, I would say you're a bit above average. When it comes to Mars and okay. our solar system. So why are we even here? You're not even, I mean, you're not even an expert, right? Mars is cool. Okay, guys, just... we're done here. <laughs> Bye. I mean, <laughs> this is just, I mean, if, if we can't even get an, esp an expert in here, what kind of radio are we? I mean, really? <laughs> We're not even professionals at this point. Well, I, I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want. I... Yeah, what? I, I meant my point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, that's that's my bad. I I don't want to to call myself an expert. Um, but if you've if you've seen my my uh, Discord profile picture or any of my profile pictures on any social medias, you know that I. I'm dedicating my life to, like, physically getting to Mars, and so if there's anything that no one else can can sort of, of think up uh, an answer for, then, I mean, I don't want to make the interview my own, but, I mean, I'm happy to, to help if anyone wants to direct anything. Yeah. And my, I mean... my main credentials is, is knowing a popular YouTuber who uh, talked about Mars a lot. His YouTube name is Martian Colonist. He has a decent number of views, if, uh, if any of you know about him. He, he, he doesn't shut up about Mars. It's pretty much all, all conversations with him go on to the topic pretty, pretty quick in real life. Hmm. So I, I learned more about Mars from him than I ever thought I would ever know. I wonder how his dates go. Actually, I know that, but I'm not going to say. Right. 
Anyway. Alright, so we can start from the basics. Um, and Scalaeus was asking earlier, why Mars? Why Mars over other planets in our solar system? Because we have other options, right? Technically. Well, not really, you see. Uh, out of the other terrestrial planets, there's only two others. Mercury is far too small and far too hot. It would never retain an atmosphere, if, even if you could go there. It, you would never terraform it in the long run. So terraforming means changing the surface and the climate of Mars to make it habitable without a suit. Uh, with other planets like Mercury and Venus, you could never do that. Mercury is far too hot and far too small, and Venus has way too much of an atmosphere. And we don't know of a way to reduce the atmosphere of Venus, while increasing the atmosphere of Mars is a lot more feasible. So out of the planets, Mars is the only one that we could really uh, feasibly make habitable in the future, with technology that we can basically do today. And then you have some outer moons uh, around other planets, mostly Titan and Ganymede are roughly the right size to have a, a, a decent, well, the right amount of atmosphere, not too much and not too little, uh, but they are uh, still a bit too small. Mm -hmm. We can get into that when we talk about terraforming, I guess. All right, so it's just a perfect candidate, right? It's the only candidate. Um, yeah, also that. At, at least with, with uh, technology we have just now, yeah. Like you were saying, with, with Venus, it's it's atmosphere, it's... Not only is it's atmosphere, it's like 90 bar, I believe. Uh, so we would get crushed if we could even get to the surface. But not only that, but it has high, or sulfuric acid rain. So not only would we have to deal with the pressure, we would have to deal with renewing the technology very often. And that isn't, isn't really that feasible. Actually, Yeah. Well, there is not many advantages to doing that compared to just having an orbital station at that point. I mean, being yeah. close to the sulfuric acid is just worse. Michael, have you seen the message on the radio chatter? Uh, they, they say that the game audio is too loud. I don't know, I, I, it's from two minutes ago. I'm not sure if you did anything. Yeah, no, it's fine, as long as people... Yeah, I don't know, um... Okay, is it fine now, guys? If, if, if you're still... If it's still hard to hear us speak, uh, let us know. Already had the bot. But I think it's... Okay. Alright, alright. Okay, let's go. All right. Yeah. No. Um, okay. So, so you were saying. So Venus is probably definitely not feasible, um, and then the other planets that are roughly the correct uh, size in order are Mercury and then Ganymede and Titan. But all of them are still slightly too small. That if you were to raise the surface temperature to make them habitable, at that temperature uh, they wouldn't be able to keep an atmosphere because you know heat is random motion. So if you heat the surface, the atmosphere will move more randomly. It'll basically escape from the planet. So you can't have them both warm and the thick atmosphere at the same time. There is not, not even in theory. So this is going to be to sound like a stupid question, but, but but why? I mean, why would we spend so much money, so much effort, and you know, risk lives probably? Well, why not? Well, yeah. Well, why not? Because... In the end, uh, as soon as the cost becomes low enough for the cost to benefits to be good, someone will do it. It's still it's still too expensive to go to the moon. And go to Mars is even w harder and more expensive than that. So, 
Right, but if you believe that technology will keep improving, at some point it will be cheap enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah but what I'm saying is, I guess a closer, a, a closer um, checkpoint would be the moon, because the moon is still empty, and you know it it would be a good testing ground, I guess, because. Yeah, 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 yeah. What I'm saying is, isn't Mar Mars a bit overreaching at this stage, when we still have to to reach our own natural satellite and do something meaningful for that? There's pros and cons. I mean, the the plan is always to go to the to the moon first to test technology, and maybe use the moon as a hub to for future exploration of the solar system. The moon is a pretty good place to build a base uh, as an interface. Um, but this... Yeah. Yeah, we will certainly go back to the moon before we go to Mars. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Ble bless you? Uh, no, it was a hiccup. I... I had ice cream a little while ago. I, oh, it doesn't doesn't bode well with me. So yeah, I guess I guess that the lunar base would be the first step. At least as a staging ground. Yeah, Kenny is asking if it would be easier to launch terraforming ships and colony ships from the moon. I, I guess yes, because of lack of atmosphere, so it's easy yes, to just just a lot easier. Yeah. Well, you, you, we're, we're familiar with it in Elite, of course. If you try to spec your ship for everything, you end up not being very efficient. And it turns out that landing on Earth is a really difficult task. It's actually the, the worst part of the journey from Earth to Mars is from Earth to space. Then space yeah. to space is okay, and space to Mars is actually quite easy, because we've done it many, many times. Space to Earth is by far the most difficult. You need a lot of specialized equipment, specialized landing gear. It just takes up space. So if you want to be efficient and minimize weight, you don't include that stuff. You just go to the moon, remove it, replace it with useful stuff, and set off from there. Yeah, there, there is definitely a lot of uh, benefits to using the moon as like a, a stepping stone or like a trampoline, if that analogy works. Um, but a lot of people... Uh, a lot of them say that it's just uh, an, an exchange of delta V where the delta V you would use to get into an orbit of the moon could be used to instead slingshot you on a, a more optimal orbit uh, to actually go to Mars. And so there's a lot of arguments against it, but there's a lot of arguments for it. And there's ultimately more benefits to actually using the moon as a stepping stone than there are to just go straight to Mars. So there's a lot of a lot more things than other than we would think of just uh for instance off of, off the bat uh the moon obviously it doesn't have its own magnetic field and so it gets helium 3 uh deposited on it and that's what people are talking about mining from the moon uh it's it's a very very good fuel for for fusion and so that would give us a lot of a lot of energy on earth solve the energy crisis that's one of the other things to going to the moon the doesn't even necessarily include Mars, but it's a very good incentive. Plus astronomy. Astronomy on the dark side of the moon would be so much easier than astronomy from Earth. Oh, because yes. All the, all the advantages of being on the ground, so you can build really big, big telescopes. Uh, none of the disadvantages of being in space, when you can't really carry really big mirrors into space. Oh my because god, Because it's really yes. dark, so... Yeah, there's a few uh, telescope plans uh, on the moon. That's one of the things I was thinking about as well. Uh, uh, again, I, the main thing that I first thought of, which was a bit stupid, was uh, getting a telescope on Mars and using that. And a, I can't remember the, the technical name, but the technique that would allow you to have... Uh, two telescopes and have them effectively act as one telescope, the, the diameter of the Earth. I can't remember what it is, but it, it's a bunch of math. That's it's the one. That's it. Yeah. What is it? Interferometry. Right. Yeah. 
as well. Uh, not, not quite. Oh, wait, not technology. No. Physical principle, not technology. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I need to be careful with words. But yeah, that, that's one of the things we want to build on the moon. I think it's called the Lunar Array. Well, it doesn't have a final name yet. Uh, mm -hmm. But definitely the best place to build a radio telescope. Huh. The best. No atmosphere, super dark, no contamination from cities. And you can build it as big as you want, really. Cover the entire surface if you wish. Make a space elevator and you're all set. Yeah, that's a whole different problem. But yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's going to, uh, How long do you reckon will take to have something like that? Because... I mean, I, I honestly, I don't see it happening, of course, in our lifetime. Oh, lunar, lunar arrays and lunar exploration, I reckon it will. Uh, oh. I don't know, you think so? Maybe lunar, but not Mars, for sure. I mean... Uh, Mars has been targeted for yeah, target. I'm targeting it for my life. <laughs> yeah, guys, I don't want to. I mean, maybe you're right. I don't want to be a pessimist, but maybe no, you should. No, pessimism be a bit... is healthy. It shows us where we need to improve and actually. Yeah, it's it's very good. I don't I don't blame anyone for pessimism unless it's just people being an ass and using pessimism as an excuse. But you're not doing that. You're fine. Oh, why? Thank you. Um... <laughs> No, I mean, again, I, I am as excited as the next guy about about this. I'm just trying to, to be realistic, because, again, for, for, for a long time, we haven't returned to the moon. And one of the reasons is the lack of funding. Mm -hmm. Because... The only reason. I mean, considering, considering how... I mean, I, again, I am not in the field. Uh, I'm not a scientist, uh, I don't work in, in this kind of thing, so maybe I'm completely off the mark and there are serious plans to get up there in the next few years. In which case, great, I will be very happy. Oh, yeah. But considering where the world is heading now, I don't know, it feels like we are currently focused on what's happening down here than up there with climate change and all of those things. Yes, you have some. You have talks about space and 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 SpaceX and Elon Musk doing crazy things, sending cars in space. But they sound more like, you know, uh, some eccentric people doing next gen things that are more experimental than actually useful to 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 the wider population. Uh, I don't agree. Well, we've also seen uh, asteroid mining technology has literally gone from nothing to a hundred in the last, what, five years. In the last five years, we have reached an asteroid for the first time. We landed on an asteroid for the first time. We took a sample from an asteroid, and now we're bringing it back. And that's from zero to not to everything in five years. Right? Once the technology becomes cheap, people do it. That's always yeah, been the rule it, of progress. Is it cheap? Well, it, it's really? getting there. The reason we didn't go back to the moon is that it was too expensive. Uh, but we're getting there now where it's, it's just not. And the day that it stops being so expensive and you actually benefit from mining, for example, helium free, it will become an industry. It's a matter of when. And it's a matter of who's going to invest as well, because it's obviously space travel is very risky. And Elon Musk, he's a billionaire and he's not, he's barely making a profit off of SpaceX just now, uh, if at all. I haven't checked the numbers recently, but it's. It's a huge risk and a lot of people aren't willing to take it and so it's ultimately who has the money, are they willing to spend it, will they spend it, will they spend it right, and will it be seen as a good thing, and will it ultimately have enough people behind it that we can apply it. Exactly. <laughs> with our with our radio we will gather funding well I, yes. I reckon we will definitely see people on Mars in our lifetime like, various countries have said they'd get there by the 2020s or the 2030s it's not in the next few years but it's in our life 
If I had to pick a country, I'd say China. I'd say China will have the first humans on Mars. I'll take that China. bet. It is the red planet. That's your reason. <laughs> it's one of the reasons they gave in their PR, okay? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not... Sh it doesn't sound very solid. They have very reliable plans. It's just China have been a bit more secretive with what technology they have access to. When they actually do stuff, it's really impressive. I mean, they just landed for the first time uh, a rover on the dark side of the moon. So no radio contact. It had to do it all automatically. Is that hard to do? Yeah, yeah, because I mean... there's no radio contact. You can't see the rover at your landing at all. It's on the, it's on the other side of the moon. The moon is in the way. It Imagine never been cutting your own hair. When you get to the, the the annoying bit where it's like it's all, it all spirals into the one weird point that you can't tell, and it's like you're trying to cut it yourself, and it's like it's as if you gave yourself uh, a perfect bowl cut the entire way around with your eyes closed and with without the ability to feel. That's what they've done with the rover. You build a robot a year in advance, and then you sit in the dark while it moves razor-sharp scissors around your head. What? That's what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> and you succeed, you get the best haircut. Yes. Right. That's a good... <laughs> it's a good comparison, I like it. Well, thank yeah, you! It, it hasn't been done before because it's really, really hard. They are definitely getting there. So is Japan. Japan also a very secretive nation when it comes to science. They just managed to get the first sample of an asteroid and they're going to bring it back. I mean, that's pretty cool. Oh yeah, what what was that? That was the Hayabusa? Was it? No. Ryugo. Ryu that's, the, yeah. What was, what was the one that began with a H? That was the one that was it, on it the It was moon. Hayabusa, yeah, it was Hayabusa. Hayabusa, Hayabusa I think, went to, to uh, an asteroid. Hayabusa 2 uh, went to Ryugo. That's the one ah. that's currently happening. Hayabusa. Of course, they had to be a ninja name because it's Japanese. Well, Japanese unfortunately, Japanese. I'm stupid enough to remember Hayabusa from Halo 3. But a ninja name too. Well, to us, to the world it is. Although, I think it is a, it is a ninja name. Come on, Hayabusa must, must have been a famous oh, ninja or something. That sounds like a ninja character in fighting game. Yeah, exactly. And, and well, and, well because he is a ninja. It's not, it's not like, he, like he's cosplaying as a ninja. He is a ninja. That's why he's dressed like a ninja. Chank, if but you're I, listening, no. we need your help. <laughs> Sorry, what? Oh. Who? Chank or Japanese. Uh. Japanese. Well, technically, I, I am supposed to be an expert too, and uh, I'm going to use my extensive knowledge, also called Google. Exactly. Yeah, see, uh, it is actually a sports bike as well. Um, <laughs> I want that bike. And, uh, but yeah, it's it's mainly from, from Ninja Game. Anyway, we are digressing. Um, back to Mars. Yes, the race is on. Oh, Kenny clarified, Hayabusa is the actual name of a peregrine falcon. Oh. So I was right, it is related to ninjas, because ninjas used falcons. Um, <laughs> Come on! Well, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe not. I'm just trying to save myself. Anyway, yeah, indeed. The more you know. Anyway, um, sorry, what, what were you saying before I hijacked the, the race to Mars. Exactly. And many countries have a shot. Yeah. It, it's weird, though. China, I mean... Are, uh, what well, I mean, um... A world superpower? Yes. Oh, no, no, I, I'm looking for... Um... Yeah. Or Google. China have been getting space research, not necessarily actually getting to space, but they've been getting space research right for the past, yeah, for the past 10, 15 years in the I, way I that would, America hasn't been. And so I to would see say they've been getting space exploration right, space research. Yeah. 
I would strongly say they haven't. They are, oh. they are the least open and cooperative nation currently in, in research in general. It's very hard to know what's going on. They kind of, they really stay between themselves in terms of research. They tend to publish a bit separately. A lot of things behind paywalls. Uh, when the rest paywalls. of paywalls, a lot of the, a lot of the research community has kind of moved on from that mentality, but they re they've remained a bit of a mysterious island uh, oh, as a yeah. country. But in terms of space exploration, they've achieved amazing things. I wouldn't say they're quite on the level of the EU yet, but there are some things they have been the first to do, so you have to give them hmm, what what's theirs. I think they're one of the main contenders for getting to Mars. Yeah. And I'm going to be completely honest. I, if I make it to Mars, I'm planning on staying there. I'm not coming back. Uh, so well, I'm, I'm not sure you would have an option. Yeah, you don't have a choice, I think. If you want the, of the early adopters, the early access Mars bundle, I'm not sure you can beta tester. You can op cop out of the beta actually. Yeah. You're stuck in that. Yeah. Well, anyway, I'm I'm just getting a taxi there. I'm not getting a return trip. I'm happy to die on Mars. Okay. I mean, you really dislike our planet. A right? lot of people are, to be fair. It's like when they they organize this uh potential reality show Mars One that ended up failing mm -hmm. terribly. A lot of people were willing to sign up for a one-way trip. Um, I'm not I'm not really surprised. It's it's human nature. Is it? Yeah. To just... I mean, why why did the British go to America when they had absolutely no information other than the fact they existed? Mostly economical reasons. Oh, well, there will be economical reasons on Mars, too, once we have a colony. Yeah, yeah, you could be the first different. baker or the yeah. first builder on Mars. Yeah, but that's different. One, th one, one thing is just, oh, let's go to America and find the riches and make our king yeah. or queen proud. One thing is, let's go and die on Mars because I hate our planet. Let's go and Cause, find America. That's pretty much <laughs> what it is. I mean... I'm pretty sure some of the people who went to America went because they hated their country, too. Actually, that is true. That... Yeah, but come on. I'm sure you see the difference here. It's a mix. It's a mix of economical interests and people who are ideolo ideologically motivated. The point is, once it becomes cheap enough, anyone of a strong enough reason can do it. At first, it will be only the most highly motivated people or the ones with the best reason. The ones who know what resources to exploit or, or maybe companies that have a specific interest. But as the price decreases and the price of technology always decreases, it will just become accessible if you have a decent reason. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about the early adopters. Okay. The early adopters of anything are crazy. I mean, you know how many people Thank died in the, in, the, in the ships of Christopher Columbus? The death rate was more than 50%. Oh, yeah, they still went. Have... Yeah. Well, then... I mean... Okay, so... What drives those people? Seeing something that's less than 1% of other humans ever have. You get to be the point oh 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 one percent who has seen Mars with their own eyes. That's enough for a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, that that question, I am I am just one of those people that you are asking. When oh, there's so many things. How do I condense it? Okay, there's definitely the aspect where it's like, okay, has anyone seen that before? No. Have I seen it, and am I the only one who's seen it? Yes. <laughs> and you can't tell anyone. And, uh, what? Yeah. Well, I can. Well, but, you can well, send messages back. a 40 back. minute delay. Yeah. It's yeah, a four yeah. Four yeah. I, guess, I guess you can post on Facebook pictures from Mars. Hey guys, first! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
That I mean, would become the most liked picture ever in the history of humanity. Because since the time we've had likes, we haven't gone to Mars or the moon. Mm -hmm. That is I, true, I guess. For the like. Def <laughs> definitely having the aspect of being the first person to have just experienced Mars. But not only that, but even if modern colonies fail, to be one of the, the people who, who start like a new humanity on, on another planet, that's, I mean, only a million oh, okay. years of evolution and that's two different species. That's insane. Uh, that is a whole... I see, I see now. You just want the girls for yourself. <laughs> well, you know, he wants to he wants to to spread humanity, so I guess you need you know. <laughs> oh darn, I've been it. found out. I mean, <laughs> I understand you. I don't, don't don't worry. I mean, I get you. But um I I'd say most people a lot of people who are driven to go there are, are, are doing it for science too. There's a lot of things you can't study with a robot, so much new things to discover. Science for the sake of science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess. I... But how how would life be there at the start? I, I guess that you would have to have a lot of compromises about... You have to forget many of the comforts that you, that you have on Earth that maybe you take for granted nowadays, and, and then you would have just to start learning how to live without it. Yeah. Is there anything that we categorically couldn't do? Well, I couldn't live about... with Iron Brew. <laughs> well, that's a problem. But I'll, you could... I'll try. You could not play online. Because Shit. there would be no one else. Yeah, so see, that's a problem, <laughs> right? Forget oh, WoW. That's true. Well, it would be good if all the people they send, right, had a hobby in common. Like, if they if they all played the same video games, because then they would D &D always have on a hobby Mars. to do. Of course, there would be D&D &D on Mars. Oh my god! Space can imagine, wizards! Can you imagine all the firsts you'd get to do? First D&D &D on Mars, first wipe on Mars, first Wait. land party, first electricity crash that ruins a land, pa land party. First person to die! No. Well, first person to be born, though. <gasps> well, no, I can't do that. I'm bit late. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess. No one's ever been born outside of Earth. No, 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 but apart from those clearly great things, but, I mean, is it worth it? I mean, first of all, you must not have any family here, if you want to embark in such a journey. No, your family so... might be supportive. <coughs> yeah, <coughs> but still, you need to abandon them. I mean, there is no, no, no option about it. Yeah, that's... So, maybe your wife or husband, yeah, go ahead, I don't give a shit. Farewell forever. Yeah, I'll just find a new family, I guess. There's not to go as well, you know. It's not like people who signed up for the army or the people who signed up for Apollo minded. They knew they had a super high death chance. I'm they not, still I'm do not it. saying that they are unaware of it. Yeah, I'm I don't think it's that... much of an obstacle. There's enough people willing to die for it. I it's can, just I another can... selection criteria. Yeah, there's a there's definitely that as an issue, but people would be willing to deal with that. Um, although in my case, I'm just I'm just not getting married or relationships at least nothing serious um but yeah uh in the case of apollo they actually had death sims in fact chris hadfield uh he described one or many of them in his in his book uh and essentially what it was is they take your family into a room, or well, no, this is just a, a description of what it is. I don't think they actually literally did this, uh, but essentially what they did was they gathered your family, uh, like nearly all of it, 
and they play out nearly every single little thing that would happen if you died at any moment like died on the way up died after you'd gotten up in an orbit but it wasn't the right orbit you came crashing down died on the pad died in space died during a spacewalk all of it and they make sure that everyone is somewhat okay with it and the amount of them that they do if your family can get if your family can get through that like previous astronauts families have then they are truly okay with it but if they aren't then it's ultimately still up to you as or well at, up to the person wanting to be the astronaut but it's definitely another factor that well is this going to be the right thing not just for me but for my family and for or well i'm gonna say the earth uh just for like the very stepping stone stages where like i the first people would be tools hammers everything setting everything up but people after that like say 50 years from now it's a bit far but uh 50 years from now when it's maybe not as dangerous would they be willing to do that that's another difficulty you have to think of, of every little thing and it's 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 very difficult to do so it's a lot to give up yeah i mean it's... Although i reckon even if they selected specifically people with no family they would still have more than enough volunteers mm -hmm. i mean i'd be one of them so hey yeah but how do you know maybe you will find a family in, 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 before before it happens and then you will have to struggle to decide what to do right i mean you can't really predict everything that will happen in your life 10 years from now or even five i mean that is true trust me trust me i try no matter how much you try you will never predict everything and things can just sure, change but, but if someone came to you and said okay you can leave for mars tomorrow it's all worked out we've selected you you get to go would you not just go well it depends it depends how many ties that's what i'm saying it depends how many ties you have and how much you care about people suddenly treating you as a fucking dick because you abandoned them forever or a hero you if, know sure or they're still a dick i mean if you have a family with kids and you're like okay dear husband dear kids i'm going to get out of your life forever bye i mean yeah. sure either a hero or a fucking dick i mean i don't know uh, well i mean you know, that's, that's a bit insulting to all the families of soldiers ever i'm not saying that they they are they are all of them like that I, I'm, I'm i'm i know that many of them are perfectly fine that i'm just is... saying that i'm just saying that the other option is also an option um it, it's not i don't think we should dismiss it easily assuming that by default, everyone would be accepting it. Well, no, not everyone, of course. But they would find enough volunteers easy. Yeah. There, there would sure definitely be a lot of, 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 of difficulties with with actually answering that question. And it's it's person to person. It's like what you're saying. Um. But in the case of people with with children going to Mars just immediately with no warning I don't think anyone would would very well this is this is also we're getting into the point where it's subjective but I don't think that anyone in that position in the right mind to actually be allowed into space would do that but if you had people who 
knew that it was it was your goal to to do something huge for humanity then they would ultimately be fine with it it would be a bit shocking to be like oh it's tomorrow um sure we'll watch your launch um but people would people would get to deal with that and it's 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 very subjective it's very person to person and so to to try and generalize it in a, in a conversation where there's only four people is 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 quite is quite difficult and if we go too deep into it it might be disrespectful but I'm, i don't know no i don't of course i didn't mean to be disrespectful i'm just trying to put myself in the shoes of someone either facing that decision or um, being close to someone facing a decision. That's all. I mean, I think it's easy to, you know, give, give past judgment on it while being outside of it. Like, oh yeah, it's so cool. I would definitely, I will for sure go and people will understand. It's another thing actually being in it uh -huh. And once the once the decision is actually once the option is actually there, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of people that would jump on the situation on the on the occasion on the opportunity opportunity and and just go with it. I'm not saying there aren't. Um, you can talk about the psychological the psychological implications that comes with living on Mars. Yeah. Uh -huh. Mm. Especially the well, the the immediate thing that comes, <laughs> the immediate thing that comes to mind. Oh, joke about psychology. Anyway, the immediate thing that that comes, uh, to my, I've said it again. That comes to mind is how would how would astronauts deal with with the isolation? But the thing is. It's, it's not actually, or well, a lot of people talk about isolation as being like a physical isolation when it comes to space. But if not only have you got round about sexist people with you, but you've got a constant stream, essentially to the world, and so I don't think the the physical isolation would be an issue, but maybe the social because I mean when it comes to only having sex people you might be there or well the beginning stages you wouldn't be allowed to be there for probably more than a few months at a time but when it got to a stage where we could be there for years how would people deal with the the social uh, isolation because the only way to deal with social isolation is to have either someone help you can I be well, go on or, or can, can I can I be mean? I mean, yeah, nerds, are, nerds are used to it anyway, right? No, no, they're not. No, they're not actually. <laughs> yeah, okay, that was low. But it's also, also not because, true. Also because I am one of them, so yeah, it's kind of. You sad. are not socially isolated. You have a lot of friends online. Well, I'm trying, okay. Uh -huh. but, but you're not. Nerds are not socially isolated. Yeah, they have I'm plenty trying. of friends I'm online. I'm trying to isolate myself. You wouldn't even have online friends. But, Fair, okay, but, the, but but there's two answers to that. One is that we've actually tested it. We have put astronaut candidates in isolated conditions for months and months, having the longest one even a year, in an isolated compound somewhere with a long time delay, you no know, communications with the outside, and the oh, yeah. bandwidth and all that. So it's been tested. We have we know like how people behave on average in those you're conditions. You're, you're talking about the thing in was it Greenland or Alaska, wasn't it? There was one in Alaska. There's, there've yeah. been a few, actually. It's been repeated quite a lot of times to see how people behave in these circumstances, and it's not that bad. Uh, I mean, the worst that can happen is mutiny. Uh -huh. but, but people don't kill each other. That was the main takeaway: that people bond. They tend to <laughs> bond against the outside world. I think the most the most crisis situation they had was when they cut communications with the base because they were having a hissy fit. I don't know. Hissy fit. They collectively threw a mutiny and refused to reply to uh, to the outside world. Wow. That was the most. That was the most drama that happened. 
that was uh, a bit passive aggressive, but okay. So it doesn't it doesn't really go wrong. So also because the second part is that when they run these things, they select people who are introverted. It's one of the big selection criteria that you will not mind social isolation because it's actually a skill in this circumstance. It's a plus. Well, it has to be, right? <laughs> My natural instincts are going to help for once. Are you okay living in a cube for two years? Yes, some people are. If you're not, probably don't volunteer. Hmm. No, I'm sure that there's a very s strict selection. Because the thing is, you don't only have to be uh, willing and able to live in such conditions, but you also need to be, you know, mentally sound. Um, and th th they need to test that. So it's... it's... No, and, and they do. As, as much as they can. It seems to be working okay. Uh, just seeing as none of these isolation experiments have actually gone wrong. There haven't been murders, or people running away, or going space crazy. Of course it's different when you're actually in space, but it doesn't seem like psychological selection is that unreliable. Yeah. They shouldn't be, right? People usually know if they're not going to be okay with living in a cube for a year. It... I mean... I am going to say now, I have only seen YouTube videos. I have not actually looked at the studies themselves and the raw data. However, it seems, just from my perspective, that people are fine with isolation as long as they're not actively aware of it. Because, like, on on these simulations, it's a simulation of, of Mars. I mean, even some of the, the more recent ones, they actually have... Uh, this is why I thought it was in Greenland because th uh, there's the the glaciers that actually kick up a lot of, of rock and so they look sort of like a, a, a genuine like plain of a desert and so it, it's definitely like it, it, it is a simulated mission it's not not an activity to, to gather data more uh, a simulation of how do we run this and how do we make sure everything's fine and so when they had those tasks they were fine with it because they didn't know or didn't notice that the reason behind those tasks well they knew it was a mass simulation but as long as they keep busy they don't really exactly. feel it yeah i think that's just in general it's very true you don't feel as... You feel like your life has meaning as long as you have tasks to do. Mm-hmm. It's very yeah, strange. but... It's... No, I'm just seeing what Scaleus is asking here, because... He's saying, isn't it different? Because we were, you were talking about testing things on Earth uh, to isolate people, but... Even when you are isolated on Earth, you still know that you're still on Earth. You're not really isolated. Um, it may feel like that, but you know that you're not really too far away. Well, you're just being locked away a bit farther apart, but you're not... If, if they want, they can come and get you out. It, it, it's... Yeah, I mean, the, the, the punishment for going outside is failing and being picked up by a helicopter later and then everyone makes fun of you. If you're in space, the punishment for going outside is death. So you'd think they'd be even more motivated to not go outside if yeah, they're but, in space. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but uh, we were talking about the um, psychological effects of it, not yeah, about sure. the, effect, the the consequences of failure. Well, we won't know for sure, but it, it, it's part of it. People don't give up on isolation, even at the yeah. cost of failure. So they wouldn't give up on isolation at the price of death. I, I can definitely see what you're talking about, but the human brain, you have to remember, is actually a really easy thing to 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 fool. I mean, people spend, or, I mean, this is just an example, but like, people spend up to years on the same, like, Gmod roleplay server, simply because it gets into their head. They know <laughs> it's not real, but, but they Sorry, enjoy they it. Sorry, they spend what? Gmod. Yeah. Oh, never, never played that. Really? Oh, it's awful. I guess you're a, you're a bit old for it. It. Gmod is amazing. Shut up. 
Well, I, I, I'm too young to get into it, I'm sorry. And Marco's a bit too old. Well, you know. I tried it. Some of the servers are ridiculously in-depth. Basically because everything is custom, you can recreate any fantasy world that you want. And just, just share it with people to roleplay as anything. Mm -hmm. So any fantasy world you can imagine, there's a Gmod server for it. And everything's very RP heavy. Yeah. Okay. My, bro my brother was addicted to Gmod. Alright. Yeah. Anyway, Another... so... Yeah. Sorry, go on. No, it's fine, on you go. I, I was, don't know. I was I just gonna expand on, on, on the Gmod thing, because I, I knew a guy, but if we were... Um, let's continue. Yeah, no, I was going to go back to Mars, well, that's That's the answer, right? If you wanna keep the, the people occupied on the way to Mars, make them a local Gmod server. <laughs> <laughs> Which they can play a simulation of being a Mars. Mars. <laughs> just, just send them up with their own VR chat room. <laughs> that is their, actually, the, the, their training software is actually Gmod. That's how they, they, they learn how to survive on Mars. <laughs> but we were talking about people training to, to go there, and um, I, I believe you mentioned, Shoba, that you know someone who plans to, right? Or did I hear that wrong? Yeah, yeah, he's done everything he could. Uh, he's just a, an. an an enormous Mars nerd. He knows everything about it, every aspect of it, all the space programs. He signed up for everything he could. Uh, he's a planetary scientist in real life. Uh, and he was one of the finalists for Mars One. Well, he's been really into it, as well as really into anything Mars related. Okay, so you think he has a good chance? If anyone has a chance, it will be him. Just because he's good at PR and he has a lot of following on various social media stuff, and that, that will that might play into it. I don't know, it depends which country ends up winning. I'm pretty oh, okay. sure if, if, if China sends people to Mars, we, we, their names won't even matter that much, because it's not in their culture to have a, a cult of personality. Well, if it's, if it's the US or the EU, you know, the personality of the people might be important. You and, think? And for Mars One, which was going to be a reality show, and it, 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 Mars One were going to pay for the travel to Mars with the proceeds of the reality TV show. For okay, that, it's all about personality. That's a bit. Um... I'm a little ashamed. I applied for that. Wait, what? Yeah. I applied for that. I we all applied for I that. <laughs> I, I I didn't, but I guess I am the weird one here. You want to stay on Earth? That makes you weird. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I admit Earth looks quite shit at the moment. Um, so, still well, no broadband. I'd I mean, I'd, I'd say it looks nice. It just smells bad. Huh. You say no broadband, but with the amount of compression that you can do for movies and shows, you would have like a hundred years worth of content on a small hard drive. Right? You would never run out of books or movies to watch. You could just yeah. pretend they're new. I just yeah, but how, how can I own noobs online? You cannot. Yeah. So if you need to pwn noobs to feel satisfied with your life, you probably shouldn't yeah. sign up to go to Mars. Well, come on. Well, you pwn the noobs by going to Mars. Yes. Fair. Yeah. But that's the only achievement then, because, well, you're just the pioneers of uh, people, uh, you're the first ones, and if it works out, uh, people will come after you. Uh, well, not after you, but will uh, catch up and stuff like that. <gasps> oh, I'm yeah. sorry. That's... Completely my fault. I was I was shuffling about because I got uncomfortable. I accidentally pressed the play button, and Bobby Darren started singing at the top of his lungs. Yeah. Well, he didn't hear. yeah. Sorry about that. That's. I'm gonna be quiet now. I need to calm down. <laughs> I thought it was another. No, it's fine. To be fair. Um... Yeah, I mean, if you guys have any other questions, because... There's a few that we haven't answered yet. We have? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had one from... Uh, 
rusted mic. Oh sure, you you can be the host now then, okay? <laughs> I mean, it's it's not like I am useful anyway. Uh, I go ahead. You have yeah. a cold, okay? Be, be we'll, the guest. We'll forgive you. Be the guest and the host, and you can stream as well while you're at it. What do you think? You know, my original plan was to stream this yeah, thing. Yeah, sure. Then... Oh. Doctor, do you want to be a radio host? Whoa. Yeah, but you are right. Whoa. You're right, rusted, rusted bulk, Mike. Asked about the thoughts, about the pros and cons of building subterranean colonies by digging or using existing caverns instead of building cities overground. I don't know, what do you think? Well, I think there's many ways to build a mass colony and they all have pros and cons. Uh, underground might actually be harder than just having bubbles on the surface. That seems uh, like the, the short-term solution. Existing caverns on Mars, we don't really know of them. Yet, we don't have that kind of underground mapping ability. Once we're there, we can start mapping things really quickly, sure. But uh, in the first stage, it'll probably be like little bubbles, little huts. You can't really go outside on Mars without wearing a suit. So you can't, you can't walk on Mars wearing just jeans and a t-shirt. You would pass out from the decompression. Basically, your, your skin would dry out and evaporate really quickly. But you don't need a really big, bulky suit either. So if you just had a sort of very thin underwear of a, a, a very pressurized thin suit uh, and a face oxygen mask, uh, you could probably go between bubbles quite easily. So you just have to put your mask on in between bubbles and you could have a bubble village. Uh, that's I been the most popular design. Bubble village. I think you'd need a jacket as well, because I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't, I don't think that walking about in negative one hundred and fifty-four degrees Celsius is is very appealing. It's not that much. It's only minus sixty, isn't it? Well, uh, yeah, not for long times. But if you had a, a nice, like, you know, what those skiing suits that are really thin and they go close to your skin and they keep you warm, you couldn't oh, stay yeah. outside for an hour. But to go in between places, you could probably be fine. Yeah. It's like a really breathable, pressurized, thin skin suit. And a, and a face mask that goes that you just put on over your nose and eyes and mouth. Oh, Nothing yeah. Nothing need a big, bulky thing. I so it's not that bad. I remember seeing con a concept thing in a documentary. It was actually on Titan as well. Uh, it's a bit off topic, but it, all, all we would actually need on Titan would be a, a, a very thick jacket and an oxygen mask. Yeah, pretty much. It's the same for Mars. You just need a... A slightly compressing bodysuit uh, and a face mask. So it wouldn't be that bad just living in many little places on the surface and going between them. Um, and it's less investment too. So the big thing that NASA is trying to uh, invest in right now is these 3D printed habitats. So they want to send these robots that can just use a bit of accelerant uh, and dust from the Martian surface, basically as a, to make concrete and 3D ah, printed yeah. things out of concrete. And they can just do it without any humans there, just prepare these little huts, habitats. And that might be a way to make it cheap, because you just use most of your material from what you find, all the Martian dust on the surface. The only thing you need is like a binding agent, that, that you, and you don't need very much of it. And then once you get there, you can just live in between tiny huts. It's not too one bad. Of, one of the things that I thought up of when I was only just beginning to think of Mars rather than just space in general for exploration was uh, electrolyzing the rust on the, on the Martian surface. That's why it's red, I believe, and just use the iron for, for construction, but it would be one, iron flakes, two, you wouldn't have that much, and three, you'd have to collect the oxygen, which would be very difficult without the iron. <laughs> So it was it was very stupid. However, when it comes to electrolyzing stuff, I have heard that carbon monoxide rockets would actually be quite good for transport on Mars. What what have you heard about that, if anything? Uh, still early. I don't think it works that well yet. The oh, best okay. bet for manufacturing fuel 
uh, on Mars is using solar panels to uh, basically el uh, electrolyze water and get uh, hydrogen and oxygen mm. with, uh, and, then, and then cool them using electric power. But uh, that would require human supervision, we think. Right. Uh, for now. So once you get there, I guess, the colonists' first worry would be to gather enough fuel for the, re re trip, for the trip back if you want to reuse the same rocket. It depends how much money you have. If you, can la if you can launch small rockets from the moon, you can just have a constant stream of materials getting to Mars, at least uh, at the start, until you get enough solar panels to get it going and enough plants uh, to get the food going. So you don't really need to come back. Manufacturing fuel directly from the surface, I think the only viable option is with water currently. That's, that's the popular one anyway. And it works for the moon too. The moon has just enough water uh, in the surface. You can separate it using solar panels and that can be your fuel. Oh yeah, I forgot that the moon has froze, it has water ice, doesn't it? Yeah, it has a bit of water ice, especially at the poles. Yeah. I completely forgot about that. It's I mean, not it's very efficient, but with time, you could. You could gather it. I need to look up on my moon facts. Um, I don't know if the question has been asked already, but um, what about the dust on Mars? Ooh. Yeah, I mean, it's, one, it's, it's the main building material they're considering, right? Dust. Yeah, it's, it's, well, it's, it's the very, very, very fine dust, and I would think it would get everywhere, really everywhere. You wouldn't have any, yeah. a way to keep it outside. Vacuum yeah. cleaners. Mm. It is it's dust. Actually, yeah. It is dust in the sense of. Imagine if we. Or, it's the dustiest dust that could ever dust. It, exactly. It's it's even. It it's, might even cause cancer. You know, it might. It might. It's it's thought the 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 dust on on Mars is worse than on the Moon. That's how how bad it is because. Oh well, on the Moon the issue is that the dust is so sharp because there's not an atmosphere to have wind. To have them rubbing against each other, to then. Well, uh, no, that's not, that's, not, that's not true. Mars has a lot of dust storms, actually. Yeah, I know. I'm talking about the moon. Oh, yeah, the moon is even worse. Mm -hmm. Moon dust cuts through everything. Yes. But on Mars, the main issue is. Well, it doesn't stick to everything like the like on the moon. No, it doesn't cut through everything like it does on the moon, but it sticks to a lot more than it does on the moon because of the fact that those winds, they're, or well, obviously the atmosphere is a lot thinner, but because of the fact that there's a lot more dust on Mars, it's very easy for that dust to actually pick up a charge. And so that, that makes it electrostatic. Yeah. Very easily. And so it... Hey. We lost you. No, I'm... I'm hearing a buzzing noise from Nightfall. Buzzing? What do you mean? It was like a, a low electrical hum. It's the computer. Yeah, it, uh... may, be, it may be the... Uh, the it's... fan... Yeah, it may be that this mic is way too sensitive, uh, so it may be picking up some electrical noise from the uh, from the case. Sorry about that. Is it is it gone. too much? No, it's, it's gone now. Okay. Okay, maybe some sort of interference. I don't know. But yeah, actually, dust on Mars has been the main reason why our current uh, exploration rovers have died. It just piles up on the solar panels until they can get any light. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy to clean solar panels, even if you sent an, sort of an independent robot to build habitats for the humans. 
before the humans arrive on Mars, it would have lots of cleaning issues. This is a huge problem. Cleaning the ironic, issues. The ironic <laughs> thing, though... It's not easy. The ironic thing is, though, that dust, while it does eventually get to the solar panels, the wind itself, like, there's huge... Or, well, I can't remember how often they happen. I think it's, like, each Martian year, uh, at least. But there's this huge dust storm that usually happens once a Martian year, and it happens globally. It is huge. It's that, amazing. It is very cool. It makes it look like a miniature Venus, which is, like, whoa. But it... It's that's the one that kills the probes. The other ones, they they are actually very counterintuitive. They clean the rovers because of the fact that the the wind it's not strong enough to pick up so much dust that enough dust is deposited onto the solar panels to then cause them to be ineffective. But it is enough dust to pick up or it is enough wind to pick up the dust that is already on the solar panels. And so overall, there's this cleaning effect, and that's why uh, Opportunity was actually allowed to last... I think its original mission was like nine months. That's that's why it only died like last year, because of one of those global, global sandstorms. It was huge. Yeah, that's one. Yeah. I, I don't know if everyone uh, is watching... Uh, has access to the Discord, but uh, Dr. Bosman just posted in in the in the chat a very very good image uh, of of the uh, of what we're talking about here, the global dust storm. It's fantastic. If if you don't have access, you really should Google it. It is, it is. I mean, it's strangely beautiful. I will see cool. the link to the picture in the YouTube and Twitch channel. Okay. Yeah. And that's the that's part of the plot of the Martian, isn't it? During the storm, you really lose contact with everything. It would mm -hmm. be a, a crisis situation. Well, in the Martian, it's unexpected. Yeah, in the Martian, the beginning, it's accurate if that could actually happen. Um, but on Mars, in reality, the largest recorded wind speed would be equivalent to that of uh well i can't remember what scale was used for hurricanes but it would be a one on earth and so the beginning of yeah. the martian is actually very inaccurate however it the rest of the movie is like science haven so getting it's one thing wrong for the particularly plot accurate. is fine i'm fine with that I, uh, I love the Martian. Plus, I don't mind the beginning so much. You can conjure up plausible reasons why it would happen as a one-off, like a really rare event where the wind speeds is really, really high. Maybe because of the shape of their installation, funneling uh -huh. wind in the correct parts. I don't know. Something. I didn't mind it so much. Like, but maybe they could have some rare event where ju just almost every dust storm happens at the once? Yeah. Are they at the epicenter or something? I don't know. Not too crazy. Probably one of the things they would actually prepare for. Yeah. If they actually did it. Because, I mean, it isn't technically a possibility, but given the fact that if it did happen, it would be detrimental, It, it they, they would definitely prepare for it. It's like... It's the same reasoning behind... The, the the US and almost every other semi-reasonable government having a protocol for aliens. It's 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 like that. It's very unlikely to happen, but if it does happen, we're ready. We're relatively and, ready. And the amazing yearly government US meetings where they simulate an asteroid impact. Have you heard of those? They're amazing. They're so fun I to read. So, so they have this big yearly meeting where they invite one US agency to simulate over one week uh, what, what, how will your, your agency react if we announced there was going to be an asteroid impact destroying the Earth in the next month or something. And they have to come up with all these what-if scenarios and it's all online. It's really cool. Well, it's easy. You just send a team up, 
to, to blow it up. Yeah, that's um, the whole point. It doesn't actually work. It's not that simple. But you have to really think about it to see the details of all the problems you could have. Anyway, that's off topic. It's just really cool. Yeah. We actually have remarkably in-depth plans in the case of an asteroid danger. Like, remarkably in-depth. People don't realize all the options that governments have in place in case we detect an asteroid on a collision course. Well, it, it, it's, it's good to know, right? Yeah. Yeah, it is good. It's quite reassuring when you realize. <laughs> but anyway, Mars. Yeah. The, the other thing about dust, uh, it might be one of the main obstacles to making Mars self-sustainable. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, we can potentially grow our own food on Mars pretty quickly. Uh, like in the Martian, they had this closed biological system where you fuel it with waste. And as long as you have some nutrients in a closed loop, you can keep growing food for a long, long time. Um, building materials are not such a problem. You can probably extract enough uh, accelerants from the soil, uh, plus regolith, to build structures as much as you want. Um, plastics are a problem. But the biggest problem of all are computer chips. You could not expand anything independently on Mars uh, in terms of infrastructure. You would always depend on the Earth chipping your computer parts. It is the one thing that you cannot build from scratch for a very, very long time. Because it requires so much industry, so much orders of magnitude more than everything else. Imagine going to live in the woods. You'd manage to catch food, you might manage to set up radio, if you're a radio enthusiast with rough coils and stuff. You would you never build Wi -Fi. from scratch a computer. You could not. It is just orders of magnitude above what you can build from scratch. A computer chip or a CPU, you need so much specialized stuff to make. Another thing is... Another thing... Mars... I think it was Curiosity that discovered this. I don't know if it's across, or well, technically no one knows if it's across the entire planet yet, but like, at least the part that Curiosity analyzed, uh, there was a distinct lack of potassium. However, everything else that is required for, for terrestrial life, I'm going to say terrestrial in reference to Earth. Um, Industry, I guess. Yeah. Everything when it comes to plants is there for the for the first people but when it comes to continuing it we would need potassium essentially raw or well not raw potassium but we would need fertilizers delivered to mars there would be a genuine market around uh just determining where we allow life to grow never mind where we can get it to grow if we get to that stage or well if we get to the stage where we can be like okay where do we want it to grow rather rather than where can we get it to grow then that is going to be a huge 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 thing and it's going to be very yeah, yeah, pretty much pretty much potassium is one of the main bottlenecks because uh, mm -hmm. it's used so much in earth fertilizers I guess the solution there would be to engineer props like GMOs that require something else in the fertilizer. Maybe something that's more easily recyclable or more easy to find on Mars, like CO2. Actually, it's one of the main paths for terraforming Mars. Uh, it's to uh, engineer a plant that would be so suitable for the Martian environment, it would just grow everywhere and output oxygen in very, very large quantities. So genetic engineering will probably be a, a big part of the long-term settlements, let's say. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if, if you talk... Oh, well, I, I... You see, now I'm at the stage where I'm having difficulty actually controlling what I want... Now I'm at... Chill. Can I, I'm going to try right? again. Do you want to break? I'm now at the stage where it's difficult for me to properly conjugate sentences to say what I want to say. That so, happens. 
come back, call me back in like five minutes. All right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I might have. <laughs> in the meantime, in the meantime, do we have any other questions that even unrelated to the topic at hand? Because we we've we've had quite a few. Um, people asking previous weeks and I'm not sure if if we managed to, to answer all of the questions so if there's anyone listening that didn't get their question answered regardless of the topic anything related to cosmology sorry say again Michael okay well we had one more on Mars it's the the topic of how how do we terraform it is it feasible uh, that we haven't touched on yet. But if anyone has if anyone has any astronomy questions, I will do my best. I know more about astronomy in general than planetary science. I know. We just wanted to, to talk about about Mars a bit because uh, some people ask for it, and, and it's indeed cool. it is it is a very actual topic of conversation. I know it is not your field of expertise, but. Um, I don't know, triangle, 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 unknown. I don't think we can send you to Mars. We don't have that authority. But I guess you can. Yeah. The best, your best bet, if your goal is to become an astronaut, by the way, is to be a, both an airplane pilot and an engineer. If you have these two traits, you have a high chance of being recruited. You don't have to be a nerd. No, you have to be a pilot and an engineer. And yeah. a if, you're, if you're an driver. aerospace engineer who also likes flying planes as a hobby, you are optimally suited to apply to be an astronaut. You can also like scuba diving as well. That's good too. Yeah. But there's no water on Mars. Yeah, but you have no, to wear a clumsy it's suit. For oxygen. It's it's mainly for the oxygen control. In fact, there was... It's a bit of a tangent, but there was a funny story... Well, not funny story. A hundred people died. But, um... <laughs> there was... There was a... A, 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 a plane crash uh, a few years... Or, well, no, not a few years ago. I think it was, like, 2001, maybe... 19... Late 19s. Around about 2000, anyway. Where there was... Uh, cabin depressurization, uh, and what happened was the autopilot stayed on, so it appeared as if it was uh, a ghost plane. Um, but the military, a military jet, actually went up, and they literally looked in the window to see what was going on, and they noticed that was o there was only one guy awake. Now this guy was identified as being one of the. Uh, one of the flight attendants and it turns out that that flight attend one of the flight attendants on board was a, a, a very good scuba diver in his spare time and so the fact of the matter was even though unfortunate it, it was a tragedy and everyone ended up dying it was thanks to him or sim them simply noticing him that they could figure out what had happened because of the fact that he had had training in oxygen management and noticing when you were uh, uh, suffering from uh, hypoxia. If if anyone doesn't know what hypoxia is, it's the it's a lack of oxygen to the brain, uh, and everyone has different symptoms. And so, if you can recognise your own symptoms, then you can get into the the sense of mind of okay control your own biology and so it was thanks to him that they were able to figure out what was what was going on and what the issue was cool. and so when it comes to oxygen control depressurization in space obviously that's quite it would be quite a big issue and so if you are a scuba diver and you're already trained in that then that's there's only positives that you can get from a lot of things 
when it comes to space travel. Yeah, definitely. Even small things like writing, like in, on the ISS, they have to fill out, well, I'm sure everyone knows this, but they have to do experiments and they have to like fill out uh, observations and other stuff. Like even even stuff like like literacy and like grammatical English can help you be more clear in what you're trying to describe. Like say something very strange happened uh, and you had to take a note of that, but it was very difficult to describe. The higher your skill in, in English, the more you would be able to put that down on paper. And so there's a lot of things from every single part of, of society that we can we can use in space. Yeah. No, no, that's true. Yeah. These, these would only be accentuated or exas what's the more I don't know the word. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. I think when we eventually select a crew for Mars, it'll be highly trained people from many different specialties. Uh, the one thing that uh, NASA selected on specifically for the Apollo missions, though, was the ability to fly, uh, because nothing replaces a lifetime of, you know, of, uh, being used to the G-forces acting on your body and staying conscious, and you can't you can't really be born with that. Well, if you're someone who's flown in a in a in a plane a lot, you know it's probably a given you're going to stay conscious already. Not only Isn't... that, but but when it comes to Apollo or or well, did you say Apollo or the shuttle program? Well, Apollo specifically. Oh, okay. They were all uh, engineers and army pilots. Mm -hmm. I think only one scientist has ever gone to the moon. Did you know that? Of all the people they sent, only one of yeah. them was a scientist. A geologist? Yeah. Everyone else is from the military. <laughs> he was very cool. Like, his style of documenting was very different from the army guys. He was way more excited about stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, they were just walking along one day and he was like, Oh, that patch of soil is slightly red. Like, they haven't. the other, the other guys hadn't even noticed, even less no, bothered to write it down, and that turned out to be a huge discovery uh, for the amount of water dissolved in the soil on on the moon. So, you know, sending people that can look at things differently, definitely a big plus. Yeah, we definitely need more scientists also on Mars. Yeah. That's, and I guess that's if, one uh, of the, that's if you're going to be isolated for so long, like, having someone like a counselor or a relationship manager wouldn't be so crazy either. And Star yeah. Trek had one. Yeah. I agree. Another thing about having scientists in, in space is not only is it very good, but it's actually becoming, or well, it's actually becoming a lot more for just regular, or well, I shouldn't say regular, but people considered to be civilians uh, into space simply based off of their ability to learn from, from or well their ability to learn has been proven through the fact that, uh, that they've had success in the scientific field and so to have people who have been proven to be able to learn who are competent enough to show that they've been able to learn and are scientists who would be going into space and actually doing studies or well experiments and other such things that's that's three things that are that are uh, a lot a lot more or well not necessarily a lot more useful but in the in the as an example the geologist uh, it's a lot more perspectives like say you get a, chem a if you get a, a biochemist on on Mars and they find something that's going to have a similar level of 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 uh, importance as as the geologist finding the water on the moon, if not more, because it's oh well, no, it will be more if it if it is found out to be life, because it's there's there's so many other perspectives that so many different fields can get, and it's very difficult to to get that from just the one field, and so every single person who is is 
able to have the right motivations nowadays they can it's very difficult but they can let legitimately everyone who has the willpower can get to space it's it's fantastic it's fantastic well there are certain things that uh, exclude you uh, forever like uh, if the medicine doesn't catch up you have certain conditions if you have that uh, you definitely can't go yeah, if Unless I was messing really my rich. thumb, I'd be screwed. Unless you're really rich and I can engineer a solution just for you. Yeah, that. But, but yeah, I see what you mean. It's a lot more uh, democratized than it used to be. It's still based off money, though, a lot. Yeah. I mean, some people have managed to crowdfund their trips to space, but I think they're still the exception. It's getting there, though. Yeah. There's been how many how many space tourists have there been like actually in space? I know a lot of people have paid for it, but like how many have actually went there? Because I think there was only there's only been two guys I believe who've went to the ISS. They went with the Russians, didn't they? Um, not sure. There's been a handful. It depends where you draw the line, uh, uh, like orbit or beyond orbit or uh, and so on. People who have been above the Carmen line without the intention of having to do scientific experiments. Is, is where I would cut it. Uh, I don't know on top of my head, I'll have to Google that. <gasps> oh, why does that keep happening? Are you sure you're fine? I Seven. should be. Hold your Seven. breath for, uh, for a few minutes, this should solve it. Uh, there have been seven uh, aboard the Russian Soyuz spacecraft, uh, and it stopped in 2009. And, that, and those guys would have been the, the proper space tourists we think of. So the ones that actually went to the space station just to visit. So there have been none in the last ten years, but seven overall. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And that's people actually going on the space station, just flying at the edge of space. It's probably a lot, lot more. Plus Virgin. Virgin Galactic is uh, starting to sell those, right? Suborbital flights, just at the, at the edge of space and back. Virgin Galactic. The best company. Well, I mean, I'm, I hate to say, but I'm, I'm incredibly biased towards SpaceX because, you know, Elon Musk is our babe. <laughs> <laughs> no. Elon but, Musk uh, fanboy. Yeah, but what what? Well, I don't know how well everyone knows the story of of Virgin Galactic, but it was, it ultimately was birthed by <coughs> the Asari X Prize that Peter Demandis uh, ran, and it was essentially. Uh, uh, a ten million, a ten million dollar prize to whoever could get a completely privately funded spacecraft to above the Carmen line. But this spacecraft had to be flown twice in two weeks twice in two consecutive weeks, I should say, and it had to be the same spacecraft. And the guy who ultimately won it, a guy called Bart Rutten, uh, he, he designed the Spaceship One, which was sponsored by Richard Branson, and when that was won, or well, just before they were confident they were going to win it, Richard Branson officially started Virgin Galactic and now that's what Starship Unity which was originally Starship 1 or 2 that's what that was birthed from it's it's Bart Rutten it, it, I'm gonna say that again because everyone listening should google him he's unbelievable he is a fantastic engineer 
Um, but Bart Rutten, spelled exactly the way it sounds. It's a fantastic story. There's a book on it called How to Build a Spaceship. It's a fantastic book. It's fantastic. It's yeah. the story of the birth of private space flight, essentially. This was all even before, or well, near the end of the book, it's around about the birth of SpaceX. Like, I think near the end of the book, it's like 2014, and I think that was when SpaceX did that whole grasshopper thing. Hmm. Using the, the first Marlin, the, the Falcon 1. Uh, but yeah, that was essentially the birth of private space flight. It's very interesting because there was a lot of struggles that we've mentioned here like there was I mean he was he was the founder of a university he obviously d he didn't have 10 million in pocket and so he he was going around trying to trying to find people to fund this and ultimately the only people who would fund it were a company called Asari Hence, a sorry X Prize, and so mm. not only did he go around making people and companies aware that this was a thing, but he was able to identify who was actually willing to go through with it. And so, when it comes to to getting funding for these sorts of things, it's actually very good to find people who are even willing to put relatively small amounts of money when it comes to space travel into play it's 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 very intriguing seeing mm -hmm. where money can come from and who ultimately wants to spend it and nowadays it's because of those original endeavors to try and find out who was going to give the money that nearly Everyone's giving money now because that the Asari X Prize was <coughs> huge when it when it was far, when it was finally announced to be to be finished when it was won uh, by uh, Spaceship One and Virgin Galactic, and so that's where the Google X Prize came in. They were willing to spend. 500 million dollars on a prize where the goal was to get a, a completely privately funded rover to the moon have that rover 500 oh well it didn't explicitly say a rover but the idea was a rover 500 meters away from the original landing site take a picture get the rover back onto the ship and return it now, unfortunately, that that uh, the prize, uh, the the deadline actually finished. I think early last year, maybe halfway through. But the companies that started from that, they they don't want to stop. In fact, you have heard recently, the, the oh, what was it? Space IL. They're the guys that put the first privately funded probe destined for the moon they ultimately did that and it was entirely privately funded they continued past the prize and so it's not necessarily even the prize itself anymore it's simply the fact that people were willing to put that up for grabs that drove so many people to be like oh okay if google is willing to spend 500 million on this where are we gonna take that you know and yep. so ultimately that is it, it all of all of this is is ultimately just the beginning of one of possibly the biggest uh i was gonna say merchandises i what's french no not french no Market, companies. yes, one of the biggest companies in markets. Technically, not in the world, but in the, oh well, I was going to say universe, but in the solar system. <laughs> Which, so. 
And, you know, Richard Branson knows how to invest. Yes. He made good Wi-Fi. <laughs> and now SpaceX is trying to do that as well. Which I love. Because I will buy it. If I can. I don't have a job. SpaceX, huh? Yet. If Tesla yeah. doesn't fail, maybe. Yeah. Let's not go into Elon Musk. <laughs> yeah, I. While I am a bit of a fanboy, I do have, I do have to say, he is a chief engineer, put in the position of a CEO, and he's also a CEO, put in the position of a politician. Which. He put doesn't... himself in the position of a politician by commenting on so many things and saying sometimes stupid crap. Yeah. But if, if he succeeds, I'd be so happy. But I've become a bit disillusioned with, his, with SpaceX's chances. Yeah. Over the last few years. There's just too many things that haven't quite worked. Hey. Unfortunately, Elon Musk does have a lot of his downfalls, but ultimately, if what his companies are were originally built for, if they succeed at those, then the world, you, you can't deny the world is going to be a better place if at least one of those companies goes where it was originally planning. Oh, for sure. I'm, I'm cheering for him. Yeah. All the things that he's attempting to do are very good things, I think, for the industry and for the world in general. Mm -hmm. I think he's, a, he's a very smart guy with lots of great ideas. The question is, can he follow through? Yeah. And how good is he at business? That's a different question. Well, I mean, he started PayPal, so I don't think business has to worry. However, running six of them at the one time, I can understand where the worry would come from. I retract my previous statement. That, that's, yeah. Yeah, well, we'll see. Good luck to him. Yes. I still think the first person on Mars will be funded by a government instead of a company. Although, I thought differently five years ago, when the, for the first space companies were having their golden age, taking, actually selling their rocket launchers to governments, that some governments became dependent on private companies to carry their people to space. Uh, but I, th I think government funding is taking a bit of an upturn now. I, w I would bank on an actual government reaching Mars first. Is it? Yeah, it is a bit. Space exploration has always been tied to a... Oh, this is terrible. It's always been tied to the arms race and nationalism, Tr trying to impress other countries, right? Trump Space Force. Well, yeah, it, but it's the same principle. The only reason we went to the moon so early was because of big international tensions and countries trying to show themselves up. Because in the end, the funding of a country is just on a different scale to the funding of a company. You just can't compete. In the US, companies have a lot of power, but still, the US government, that's where the money is. Yeah, I guess. When, it, when it came to the, the Cold War especially, the Cold War birthed the space race and because of the high tensions the space race temporarily got given a very small chunk of the military budget which while it is a very small chunk of the military budget is still the military budget so that's why there was so much development done in in such little time because people could afford to do it it was an environment where scientific endeavor while it was ultimately to try and kick someone else's ass it was scientific endeavor it was it was ultimately fantastic yeah. yeah and it's gotten us to where we are today in fact we wouldn't have phones if it wasn't for the space race we wouldn't have computers if it wasn't for world war Two. yeah well, actually, I think they were starting on it in World War One, but they didn't actually get anywhere near going through with it until World War Two, because that's when the Turing, the the Turing, no, not the Turing test, the the Alan Turing 
a mechanical computer. That's when that got into use and then everyone saw, oh, this is a fantastic piece of equipment, how else can we use this? And someone said, I could use that in my house for ordering stuff online. Well, not quite. <laughs> well, not, yeah, maybe not, maybe not immediately. But, yeah, there was, there was a lot of, of places for, for technology to begin. And it's, un or well, I say it's unfortunate that we don't have a Cold War, but, uh, we it's almost do. It's, yes. unfor it's unfortunate that we don't have anything to motivate us on the scale of the co of what the Cold War did. That's all I'm gonna say. I'm not saying the Cold War was a good thing. It was pretty bad. Tensions were bad. I wasn't even alive so, for it, but even I didn't like it at the time. I think space exploration is getting a bit of a boom in funding right now. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it is searching for other planets or within our own solar system. And I don't know how much that is due to the modern political tensions that we have and more national pride, but it's probably linked, as mm -hmm. it's always been. It's, it's an easy way to show up other countries. I mean, can you even imagine if China actually win the Mars race? They would yeah. be seen com completely differently on the world stage, and they know it. Mm. It's because sad to think that, that uh, yeah. Because they can still uh, do it wrong on the political side of things. If they want Mars for themselves, that might happen. The entirety of Mars for themselves. Yeah. Well, if they manage to bring arms over there first, then they could, in theory, protect it uh, or defend it uh, against yeah, the invaders. Yeah, uh, I. I, I are you talking about them launching weaponry into space? I doubt there would be a war. That goes know. against the Geneva Convention, the Space Treaty, and the... Mean, you mean like Trump the... publicly said he would? Oh! Well, you mean like when Trump yeah. publicly said he would start a space corp and send weapons into space, breaching like 10 international agreements? Yeah, but Trump is... I mean, he's not going to last very No, long. it's the US, so law doesn't apply to them. No, no, I'm just saying that Trump is an idiot, and whatever he says shouldn't be taken for actual reality. So no, I, I but no, it's a true point. It's what you said. If 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 Trump puts weapons into space, or if China claims Mars, sure they're not allowed to. But what are you going to do? Yeah. If they're yeah. the only ones with the with the technology to do it, I mean, and tough if luck. Tell anybody, then who, who can do anything about it if we, if we don't know? If they are the first on Mars. Who is controlling them? And even if you find out, what do you do? Do you start a war on Earth over a few weapons on Mars? I mean, come on, no country would want that. True, I guess. Could mean the end of uh, space exploration for the time being. And if if uh, China actually decides to tell us off and uh, not let us land on Mars. Well, it would be a halt to our space exploration and a boom for theirs. Well, in sci-fi, there's always a, a prevalent culture that uh, aliens interact with, right? In Star Trek, it's the Federation. But what if the Earth wasn't unified by the time we make contact? And no one's to say that Earth, Earth will be unified before we spread over the galaxy. Maybe a country will actually win. How do we know? I mean, in Elite, Earth government isn't unified. I just had a strange thought. What if China renamed Mars China? <laughs> then we all go to China. Uh, that would be confusing, to say the least. Ch China, China 2.0. Neo China. Neo China, of course. Anyway, guys, we are out of time. I believe, and it's been two hours. I mean, it's been it's been mostly random chatting, uh, not much actual science. I see a like. comment, Alan Turing, yay! Yeah. That's so we did good. We did good. We managed to fill up almost two hours. I'm not sure how, but um, 
I think I just waffled on a bit. Just a, just a bit. It's alright. Yeah, it's thanks to your awesome enthusiasm. Thank you! Oh, hey, good God, luck. My voice good luck there, with yeah. your, uh, good luck with your, um, you know, trials at becoming a, one of the first settlers. Dying on Mars. Yeah. You want to, to be the first person to die on Mars, right? Yes. Cool. So you just go there, you just go there and commit uh, Sudoku and that's that's it, right? Commit not a life. Sorry, what? Commit not a life. Yep. That's more of okay. the programming end of things, I say. Sorry, no, no. don't talk about programming. Yeah, I'm not sure I got that, but I, I will I will act as if I did, so it's fine. No, it's, it's not programming, it's just... A, unfortunately, the only properly entertaining thing that me and people at my age can properly laugh and understand is memes and essentially saying commit death in any other form is I guess um I guess, I guess young people nowadays are a sad bunch, huh? Like young people in your we day are. are better. No, we didn't laugh only at memes. We are very <laughs> stupid. I'm pretty sure my generation only laughed at memes. Yeah but you're younger. You're you're another generation. Wait, Even how old are like... we all here? Shit, how old am I? I'm 26. I'm 17. Yeah, so... You're a kid. Yes. Legally, right. and... Yes. I do understand, it must be hard growing up these days. No, it's, it's growing a... up with smartphones must be awesome. Yeah, indeed. Well, smartphones... And... The rest of life... Yeah, but you use smartphones to just share memes, and you believe that's the basics of witty comments and humor. That is just sad. Like the forums we grew up on were different, come on. <laughs> Sorry, say again? Like the forums that you and I grew up on were any different. They were. They were all memes. Not really. <laughs> I'm not sure what you... Ring a bell. I'm not sure what forums you frequented, but, um... By the time I came to memes, some of them were already old. So they must have started with your generation. I don't know, maybe, but... You know, the, the vintage memes... Which are still to be respected... <laughs> the honorable vintage uh, exactly. memes. Exactly. They, they are a thing, but nowadays... People just... Force memes on everyone, as if... It's a new way to communicate. You know, memes become a thing when they when they serve to be. And nowadays, there are just too many, and people communicate with them. I've seen people literally, like, starting, uh, conducting, and ending conversation just with memes. It's like, are you able to use words? Have you studied language? Like, you know. <laughs> That's a bit sad, I think, but hey, anyway, it's getting late, classic, I'm digressing. Classic, it was better back in my day. It was better, <laughs> you know, at the, at, the time of, at the time of all your bays are belong to us, those are the good memes. That you was know, a good meme. The, the original memes, the, the, vin the, the actual the founders. Yeah, Nowadays, it's, it's, it's like the Pokemon, you know, the first generation is the better. Is the best one. Is is. I'm pretty the, sure everyone thinks that the generation they grew up with was the best. No. I think the memes I grew up with were the best. Yeah, but because I, you don't understand. I, I was <laughs> yes, <born. laughs> everyone thinks that. I, I I was born in 2001, so I w I was born with essentially the same stuff from the 90s, but I got the slightly upgraded versions, and so I didn't have the long beeps. When it came to connecting to the internet, I had the annoying ones. The I'm sorry, but you, you you didn't even survive the millennium bug. I mean, you're just. I mean, you don't well, even deserve. I'll let you know that I was stupid enough to do the first of the first 1970 thing with my first iPhone. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> well, 
classic. Back classic, when classic. I was little, uh, we had car phones. Oh, yeah, Ooh. man. Yeah. Forgot, so, forgot they were a thing. Yeah, they were a thing. <laughs> For my 10th birthday, I got a Sony Walkman. And I was so happy because I could put a CD in it. I carried it everywhere. What it? Yeah. yeah, exactly. A Walkman used use. Uh, used it was called the Sony heads. Walkman, the OG Walkman. No, not really. Well, it was yeah. called that. No, because CDs were already modern. We're talking about cassette tapes, the original Walkman. Oh, I guess. Because See, you're way too, you're way too young. You don't even understand those things. No, I don't when, I back, in, back in my days, back in my days, we were recording. On the cassette tapes, songs from the radio. Yeah, I there did were that. No, MP3. no, I did yeah. that. I recorded okay. songs on the radio. I recorded all sorts of things on the cassette tapes. <laughs> Recording on a CD was way too high tech. Yeah, no, of course not. But... I'll have you know, I grew up watching v VHSs and playing my Game Boy. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, hey, me too, Game Boy. The only difference to me was that mine was a hand me down. Well, I played on my Intellivision, okay? <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, okay I'm <laughs> gonna be honest. <laughs> Literally no one. <laughs> this is turned into, is my age yeah, better think, than yours? I think it's time to, I think it's time to wrap up. Yeah, tonight, has yes. a, um, tonight has been a bit of a casual talk. Um, as soon as we find another worthwhile topic about of actual science, we will. Yeah, please share, because um, honestly, I am personally running out of ideas. So. Well, there's still a few we can do. Yeah, I've, yeah, guys, I've had guys, an idea. Guys, guys. Guys. We will have someone else joining us. Uh, real so we will have a broader uh, spectrum of answers. What do you mean hi. real? What do you mean real? The second astrophysicist. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're a cosmologist, but he's just an astrophysicist. Let me just. He is just an astrophysicist. I'm an astrophysicist. Well, I hope he's not listening. I I don't want to talk bad about. We need to, him, so. we need to see we need to see credentials though, because we only take professionals here. Well, uh, we are um, serious people. Um, so he's the fourth. Yes. He studied physics in college and then astrophysics in grad school. Uh, competed with PhD doing computer simulations of supernova remnants. Uh, the gas bubble is carved Ooh. out by supernovae to shock waves. Then I probably know him IRL. Yeah. If I knew his real name, I could look him up. <laughs> well, he didn't tell us his real name, but his uh, Discord name is Mayhem. Like, well, I'm sure that I'm sure that he will uh, be able to. Just look into the interviews channel. You, uh, he will be willing to share his name, probably. I mean. Yeah. Oh, I've got a good question for him. Well, uh, at least we have a. a well, we can't give more answers since we have, yeah, well, a broader field now. Cool, cool. So we'll think about something for next week. Yes. Yes. And um, we will let you guys know in advance so you can prepare your questions beforehand. Yeah, also then we have a quick look at the schedule so we will have to do this weekend. Um, yeah, it's uh, our this week's interview, which is originally uh, scheduled to be on Friday, has been moved to Saturday, and it will be the Shadows of the K. No, that will be tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow's interview at 7 p.m. as always, Shadows of the K, uh, which will be held by Raptor and me. And after that, uh, on Saturday, we will interview Dr. Kai. So uh, those names are so confusing. <laughs> We will interview both of them, one on Friday, one on Saturday. Stay tuned for updates on that, and yeah, uh, that's uh, the schedule for this week, as always. Sunday cool, cool. Indeed, you don't want to miss those interviews, they sound interesting. Yes, alright, now let's really wrap it up. <laughs> yeah, I'll, uh, let's just leave room for music. Yes, alright.
thanks for your question. Indeed, this has been, uh, as usual, Dangerous Cosmology with Dr. Shoba, also known as Sarah Bosman. I'll see you again next week, guys, and uh, maybe I'll see you out there in the black. Have a good bye night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye. Cool.